Hello, everyone. How's it going? I hope you all had a great GDC experiences today. And welcome to Firebase, where we talk about mobile gaming experiences and how we can make it better for you. Hi, I'm Chen. I'm the iOS tech lead. Um, sorry, I think I don't have the click. There you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chen. I'm the iOS tech lead for Firebase Cloud Messaging. I'm here today with two of my Google colleagues, Patrick and Sumit. So yeah, my name's uh, Patrick Martin. I'm a developer advocate based out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. I actually have a degree in game development, and I've spent the last decade or so uh, building mobile games and also robotic toys. And I'm Sumit Chandel. Uh, I've spent a number of years at Google developer advocating a lot of different products, including Google Web Toolkit, AdWords API, Android Wear, and most recently, Firebase. Uh, so we're pretty excited about uh, sharing with you how Firebase can help with your game development. And with that, I'll throw it back to Chen. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So there's three parts to the talk. First, we're going to give an overview about Firebase, along with some of the latest updates. And then I'm going to invite Patrick back on stage to show you how to build a game with Firebase and cloud services. Uh, Patrick is going to cover some of the new features coming up this year, so it's going to be a great technical overview. And then we're going to bring uh, Sumi back on stage to show you how to grow your users. Um, driving player engagement is a critical part of the business. So stay tuned for that. So what is Firebase, right? On a higher level, Firebase is Google Cloud's specialized mobile and web app development platform. Let me give you a little bit of background. Um, if you come here uh, to any of the Google Cloud talk today, you probably already know that the Google Cloud is a powerful tool, right? It is built on cutting edge technologies in both um, hardware and software infrastructure. It is also platform agnostic because no matter what platform your games are at, GCP can support it, right? It can, it can be your backbone because you remove the burden of provisioning and managing your own server and it provides a variety of tools, right, to help you to scale. So tools like App Engine, Cloud Storage, uh, BigQuery, TensorFlow, and many, many other tools, right? It's very powerful. And it provides a reliable and secure connection so you can safely deploy your code to the cloud. So what is Firebase, right? Firebase is built on top of the GCP and it is uh, specialized in mobile and web applications. So if you're building a mobile game or web app, Firebase is more tailored to your experiences uh, because we focus on uh, many of the common problems, engineering problems that uh, mobile developers are facing, right? And also, uh, we provide custom APIs that, uh, so, so your app can easily communicate with the GCP, the Google Cloud Platform. So in a way that uh, we provide quicker path to get you started on GCP. So here's a subset of the Firebase products that we're gonna talk to you about today. Um, as you can see, Firebase delivers solutions throughout the entire life cycle, right? Um, from building a game, improve the quality, to in, in, engage more users and driving player retention, right? And no matter what your team size is, right? It could be a one person startup or enterprise level companies, right? We have tools that can support any use cases. And our products also focus on many aspects of the business. Right, if you're an engineer, engineer like to focus on problem like uh, how do I do this more efficiently, right, or how do I scale? Um, so we have tools like that. So for example, if you're sending push notifications, we have cloud messaging. And then uh, if you want to do user sign up flow, we have authentication. Or if you want to, how do I do uh, build a serverless infrastructure, right, we have uh, GCP tools like cloud storage and Firestore, right? And these are the critical components of building a game app, right? Um, and um, that's why what engineers would focus on. And Firebase provide tools so that you can um, help you to save and they save the cost and they, they also help you to build the infrastructure so you don't have to do that. Um, if you're a product manager, right, you wonder how does my game uh, perform, right? You, you want to understand your users better. So we have tools like that as well, like uh, analytics, A-B testing, or BigQuery, right? A lot of our products can export to BigQuery uh, easily so you can deep, do deep analysis on GCP. And you can also run experiments, right, to understand your users better while making the product decisions. And lastly, if you have QA team, right, we got uh, great tools there to cover like um, any aspects of improving your app's quality, like crash analytics, performance, and test lab. Uh, later in the session, Sumit and Patrick will uh, do a deep dive on some of the use case to show how exactly you can do this. 
And what's the best about Firebase and GCP is that they work well together, right? Um, under the hood, they have the same project and same billing account. So it's uh, very easy for you to manage. And if you're a cloud customer, you can import your project to Firebase instantly. And many of Firebase products are already running on GCP, such as cloud storage, Firestore, um, and the cloud function. So anything with the cloud. So say you're first time users. What do you get outside this Firebase package, right? Let me help you to visualize it. So first you get a Firebase console. It serves as a developer uh, control panel, right? It is where you set up a new project and uh, you can configure and monitor in your Firebase services. And then you get a bunch of SDK, right? You pick and choose the one you need, you install it in your game, and you run a bunch of code to quickly enable the functionalities. And the client will make a secure connections to the Firebase service on the cloud and to the console, so you all sync up together, right? And the best part is you don't have to build any of the infrastructure, right? And it, it is secure, it's scalable. Oh, and one more thing, um, Firebase, uh, the console is also a great tool for your game designers or marketing people if you, they want to like monitor data or edit game contents. And we'll provide a variety of SDKs. Um, if for majority of the developers here, the game developer, we have C++ and Unity cross-platform SDKs. And if you are an iOS and Android developer, like me, we have that as well. And lastly, our web SDKs uh, support both mobile and web applications. Firebase was launched since 2016, and over the three years, we've seen tremendous growth. Um, to this day, we have over 1.5 million monthly active users, uh, apps. And developers choosing us because a Firebase is easy to use, it's powered by Google Cloud technology, and it integrates well with many cross-platform and third-party tools. Now I have some new updates for you. Uh, if you're a Unity developer, now the onboarding flow has become easier for you. Previously, when you set up a Unity cross-platform SDK a project, you had to set it up twice. You had to go to the iOS platform, set it up, and do it again on Android. Now we get this shiny Unity button. If you click on it, now you can set up both your iOS and Android app at the same time. And download the configuration files and import to your project and finish with downloading the Unity SDK. Again, it's quick and easy. Lastly, I wanna talk a bit about open source. At Firebase, we really value the transparency of our SDK. We understand that it is important for the developers to know the exact behavior of our source code, especially when it comes to how we handle the user privacy and data, which is why we're excited that our CPAPAS SDK is also open source now. Now, if you're a CPAPAS developer, you can choose to integrate to one of our open source SDK. With the source code accessible, it provides great flexibility in your development flow, right? First, you can audit your source code and um, make modifications at your own pace. And the Firebase um, open source community has continued to grow over the years, right? And more and more SDKs from different platforms have been open source. And now, you can help contribute back to the community. You can be part of it, right? Um, first, you can help port the SDK to a different platform that we don't support. Or you can help making contribution to the existing SDK by adding new features or fixing issues. Now, I'm sure you all got excited about using Firebase in your games. I'm gonna pass that to Patrick to talk about it. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Chen, for uh, that introduction. And um, what I want to talk to you now is uh, how to build, what it's like to build a game in Firebase. And I think kind of what will make this easier for everyone to understand if I first, is if I first gave you guys a little bit of background from where I'm coming from. So for the past couple of years, I've been doing a lot of research and development and prototyping. And it was the kind of thing where you know, I'd have a few days, maybe a week, to throw a whole bunch of stuff together, get a concept off the ground, and get it testable. And I didn't need that test to, like, live past the meeting where it got approved or something. So I used a very different stack than I did back when I uh, worked on kind of asynchronous multiplayer games. You know, if you ever work on something like that, you kind of need your servers to be accessible all the time, 24-7, 
and for any play length. And the tools to uh, achieve each one of these is, are typically completely different sets. You'll normally rip everything up from your prototyping and do something brand new in production. And uh, I would say that, yes, there we go. Um, the job of every uh, developer, every game developer, is really to find the fun. Whether you're in pre-production, post-production, or working on a game, uh, your users aren't paying you for like just pretty graphics or cool tech. It's something fun that they can enjoy. And Firebase, I think, helps shorten the distance from any idea you have in your head to being able to actually experiment and uh, iterate on it. And not only is this then backed by Google's cloud platform, as Chen mentioned, but uh, if for whatever reason Firebase doesn't meet your needs once you scale up from prototyping to production, you do have the full brute force of Google's cloud behind you and you can uh, work directly there if that's where your needs take you. So I wanna kinda show you what it's like building a game really quickly using actually a single player game called Mecha Hamster, which is our, uh, it's our testing project for Firebase's Unity integration. So Mecha Hamster is really simple. It's like one of those uh, old wooden marble maze games. You just tilt your phone and get Hammy the Hamster to the end of this maze up here. Uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, I'm sure you guys all get it. Um, and what I'm going to do is enhance this single player game uh, by giving it kind of a, a cloud backend with uh, secure and shared data in it that I probably wouldn't want to risk otherwise if I didn't have something like Firebase to host it on. So uh, the way we decided to start expanding this game was to build our own level editor. Uh, the, the basic idea behind it is that, uh, you know, normally a designer would have to go through the entire dev stack to get a build onto a phone to test it, which could sometimes take minutes. And then other people wouldn't necessarily get to play unless you walked over to their desk or you pulled it down from a build server. So we really wanted to build something that, you know, you could work on on the phone, press play, test it instantly, and just share it out to the whole team really quickly, like at the press of a button. Um, and since these levels are just like a 2D grid, it's a very easy thing to serialize, store, and interact with. So we decided to use Firebase's real-time database. Uh, this represents all of the data in your database is effectively a very large JSON document, which I know some people love JSON, some people hate it. The point isn't that you're writing JSON, but that many uh, languages and game engines, like Unity, can serialize to and from it just as a library function. So, uh, you know, we just hit a uh, node with the JSON serializer, get all the data out into a database. Um, and I wanna focus on the real-time bit just a little bit. Uh, it, this isn't real-time like, you know, 30 frames a second, like a video game, but this is real-time enough that you could do something like Google Docs, uh, you know, collaborative editing. I, I find that sometimes I can even type on one computer and look at another and kind of know what I'm doing in a Google Doc. You could do the same sort of synchronization in a level editor if you built out the UI for it. But the other really cool thing a real-time database does for you is uh, cache everything. So if you're offline, if you like drove through a tunnel while you're working on a level, all your writes are still instant to the database, and you can use the database provided in our SDK as kind of your single source of truth. Um, and then whenever you go back online, uh, your local copy doesn't get stomped with the web, and the web copy doesn't get stomped with your local copy. We just replay the transactions you made while you're offline, which is kind of a nice way to protect against data loss as you're doing these migrations. It's kind of a hard problem if like, you've ever had to implement this on your own. And a cool thing that came out of all this work to build a level editor is, uh, well, we're, we're all game developers, right? We're at the game developer conference. And I'm sure we all had that moment when we realized that games are not magical plastic disks that appeared in like a game store, right? Or in my case, cartridges. Um, for me, the moment that I realized this was when I found the Quake One level editor and I started making 
uh, actually really bad maps where only I knew the cool weapon drops or like sniping positions or something. Uh, so why couldn't we enable fans of Mecha Hamster to express their creativity like that and maybe uh, you know, join us in the creative process? And even though we're storing this data in the cloud, we're able to confidently enable this kind of curated user sharing with uh, this rules language that we have with real-time database. This is just a JSON object with annotations that lay parallel to your database. Um, and they're relatively simple. I've, I've actually simplified this a bit more just so it fits on the slide. But here we're just saying the node map list is readable by the entire internet. But by changing this to the string auth not equals to null, uh, we guarantee that any user trying to read this map list will only get it if they are logged in. And these statements you put here can be JavaScript ex expressions. So you can enforce rules like only the creator of a map can use it until they mark it as shared, stuff like that. Um, and where that auth came from is actually from Firebase authentication. In Mecha Hamster, we opted to use uh, email address and password account management, as well as something called anonymous sign-on. Uh, anonymous sign-on in particular might sound weird, but all it's doing is, is uh, associating your device with the account instead of like a username and password. And later on, if the user wants to share their data between uh, devices, they can migrate up to a email address account. And you can, of course, opt out of signing in if you just don't want these online features. And uh, I should stress that this email address password authentication isn't me being silly and thinking I can implement my own like sign-in logic with like all the security issues associated with this. This is a Firebase product and has all of Google's security guarantees, but we also support all these other authentication providers. Now, if you're prototyping and you're just trying to get an idea off the ground as fast as you can, use email address and password. But uh, all you have to do is integrate the client SDKs for each one of these auth providers, and we do everything else in the cloud for you, you know, va validating the user token. We even let you merge and migrate accounts. So Game Center on iOS is a new integration. If you added it to your app, you could uh, allow your users to add that to their account, and all of a sudden, they have a new way of signing on that doesn't require them to start again from scratch. Um, so another thing we wanted to do is add leaderboards to Mecha Hamster. This is super common in games, and it's so common that we just made it open source. So you can go up here, grab uh, the source code for uh, a sample leaderboard integration, and actually start trying, start playing uh, with real-time database right now in your existing game, writing just a minimal amount of co code. Get your feet wet, decide whether or not it's right for you. So that's at Firebase Extended slash Unity Solutions. So we wanted to augment our, uh, our leaderboard, though, with user replays. Now, for, something, for reasons that might become apparent later in my talk, uh, we had replay recording in Mecha Hamster. So uh, we decided we'd show how people got, uh, ooh, there we go, yeah. Um, how people, we wanted to show how people got the high scores that they had. Um, and you know, you might just think, hey, I'm gonna use uh, JSON serializer in Unity and just dump whatever data structure I have for the uh, replays into the real-time database. But it turns out, even compressed in a flat buffer, these replays are around 30 to 60 kilobytes. And at some point, the real-time is not real-time just because you're passing a lot of data. And also, you don't wanna collaboratively edit uh, replays. Uh, that, to me, that sounds more like cheating than a feature. So we needed somewhere large, as you saw, to uh, store this replay data. And we decided to use cloud storage for Firebase. Now, this is another database. It's a key value storage, where the key is just any path, so you logically order this however you want. And the value is really anything you want to put up there, you know, videos, player avatars, in our case, you know, replays. And the flow for uploading a high score now becomes, you know, you add the high score to the high score table, there's an extra node there for the replay will live. You start asynchronously uploading the replay data, you get a callback when that completes, and you can just update the node in the leaderboard to point to your replay. 
There is one problem with this, though. Uh, now that we have two databases, when a high score is no longer a high score, the uh, replay data will leak. So we use something called uh, cloud functions to listen for when there's a change, in this case, a create event in the real-time database. When that happens, we check how many high scores there are for the map you're on, knock off the lowest if there are more than five, and clean up the uh, associated replay data. So cloud functions are actually a really awesome tool for someone like me who's lived mostly in the client space. Uh, they're just now out of beta for Firebase, and they let you run mobile backend code without managing the servers. Again, if I'm prototyping, this is an awesome shortcut to get to where I want need to be. And it is still on like, you know, Google's cloud infrastructure, so this, these are reliable and scalable. Uh, you write these in JavaScript or TypeScript, and you have the full, uh, you know, NPM package manager to deal with, so you can really go crazy here. They're still secure, so Firebase authentication still applies. Uh, auth not equals to null is a valid way to check if a user's logged in, and the user's guaranteed to not be spoofing their, like, user token or something by now. And uh, these let you not only communicate between different Firebase products, but also between Firebase and the web. So just some examples of what you might use these for in games. If you have, uh, like, asynchronous multiplayer board games, Rather than just trusting players to not claim that they roll nat 20s all the time, you know, they're the Gandalf of Monopoly or something, uh, you can push your die rolls off into a cloud function. If you have a gacha mechanic in your game, uh, you know, you can use the cloud function to make sure they have enough capsules or whatever, subtract one, roll the loot. But if you're using something like uh, Crashlytics from Firebase, um, you can actually listen for a new crash to happen in the wild and actually automatically file a JIRA for your team. Maybe if a crash spikes an occurrence, you send a message to like the SOS channel on your, Slack, on your team Slack and uh, everyone starts rallying around it. So now it's time to ship a game, right? And the thing that keeps me up at night whenever I hit go is when that inevitable review comes in that says, game is a blank screen on launch or it crashes on launch. Like, you know, it worked on all our devices in the, te in the QA test lab, but there's just, something in the wild we couldn't take uh, account of. So you really need to run your game on actual uh, hardware. You need to test various OS and hardware combinations, because even if you're using test-driven development, something like you're using a feature in a shader that's not supported will still cause a uh, shader compilation error. I actually once had a game as black blank screen on launch because uh, the OpenGL context claimed that it supported a level of anti-aliasing that it actually didn't, and it just failed to create my context for me. And you really want these to be automatic, you, like not just a human going through. You want to be able to shove these up to a server with some cadence built into like your build pipeline and be able to know the f at the very moment a build fails. So uh, for MechaHamster, we're using RoboTest and Firebase Test Lab. Now, Mecha Hamster uh, didn't have many unit tests, and at least in my experience in the industry, that is really common in video games. Um, but with RoboTest, we can just upload the production APK, and, well, the, the way I like to imagine it is a friendly little robot walks into your game, kind of stares at your view hierarchy, and then presses all the buttons as fast as it possibly can until it crashes or it times out. Uh, and this will run on real hardware. There's like literally like racks of phones or something in a data center somewhere. Uh, and what's really cool about this, especially for the kind of test it does, um, it might be hard for me to reproduce. I might CNR the bug just because like it required tapping in a specific spot in the splash screen or something. So it records the video, shows you little circles of where this robot was interacting. Uh, you get the stack trace if it crashed. You get the logs of like everything that happened leading up to it. And you know that this ran on kind of a clean environment. There's not like that weird app that kills applications in the background to theoretically save battery life or something. This is like just a stock device that you're running this on. But uh, some engineers in the room might have noticed that I said this robot walks around and looks at your view hierarchy. And we're game developers, our view hierarchy is probably just the GL context. Um, so 
this seemed kind of useless. So, of course, we decided to use our AI chop to uh, create something that we call AI-assisted monkey testing. This uses machine vision to look at the output of your game like a human, find things that look interactable, usually buttons, and concentrate the random presses at these buttons so you don't have to expose your custom UI to uh, robotest, or in this case, AI-assisted monkey testing, to get a useful test. As you see here, the AI-assisted monkey testing uh, video is already to the logical end of this unit test, whereas the robotest is still clicking around in some corner of the screen somewhere. If anything else, this is just a safety net for your existing QA team. You don't have to do any additional integration in your APK. This is running on actual hardware in a data center, as I pointed out, or on virtual devices if you want to test like weird OS or screen combinations. And yeah, it's pretty cool. I had another bullet point, but yeah, <laughs> I already went over it. So uh, there's another kind of unit testing, though, that I, we usually called it like demo loops or like a profiling test. In a Firebase test lab, we call it game loops. Um, and the general idea of this is that you know what parts of the game you need to hammer. You know how to load all the shaders, get a bunch of geometry on screen. And not only do you want to see if phones will run it without crashing, but you might also want to profile this and make sure you're hitting your min frame rate targets on all your devices and kind of build up a list of which devices you need like a lower performance uh, profile on or something. So once again, you upload your production APK to the cloud, we'll run on real devices that span the range of low end to like, you know, flagship phones. And um, the way this works in a production environment is it sends something called an intent, which if you're not familiar with native Android dev, like you're just coming from a Unity background. This is basically a command line argument, but to an Android app. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in Unity. I wasn't quite sure how I'd get this in. So when I looked at Mecha Hamster, I found like this uh, uh, game loop uh, class, game loop manager class. I'm not sure where it came from. It's actually from this code lab. It's very easy to follow. Um, if, you, uh, if you already profile or use demo loops, I'd recommend walk through this and you just instantly grow your QA test pool for this sort of thing. Again, even if you don't want to do this, if you want to put the minimum amount of effort possible into testing, um, not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but sometimes it's the reality. Uh, just upload your APK now. And you just gave your uh, QA an extra little bit of safety net um, as they go through their normal approval process. So, uh, you're still gonna have crashes in the field. You can't catch everything. Again, there's like that crazy app that kills games in the background and people root their phones and all this other stuff. You're still going to need crash reporting. And uh, Crashalytics is uh, kind of a really neat way to gather crashes from the field and sort them by like frequency, device type, OS version, um, everything you need to, stack traces as well, everything you need to uh, not only figure out why a crash happened, but see if it's something you need to address. Because the, the reality is that some phones will just have a marginal market share, right? And um, if you cannot uh, reliably fix the crash in a short amount of time, if this phone is like a fraction of a percent of your market, it may be uh, more fiscally pertinent to just blacklist it on the Play Store. But if a brand new flagship phone comes out, and your game's crashing all the time on it. This actually happened to me when the first multi-core phones came out. You can, if you have that uh, uh, cloud functions hook running, you might get a spike in the SOS channel, like this bug is happening a whole lot, and you can rally your team around, make sure you get that pre-order in, and start testing on the new phone, um, if, that's, if that happens to you. Um, and Crashalytics is now integrated with Unity, which is really awesome to me. Again, in the past, what would happen is I'd get like the C++ stack trace, that I'd have to bring that into the IL to CPP output, and then try to figure out what C Sharp generated that, which w was kind of a process. There were helpful guides for it, but it took me a little bit of time. In this case, I accidentally cleared a field in a uh, game object, and I got a stack trace and Crashalytics almost instantly, I was refreshing like the dashboard, 
that showed me exactly where to look to find this. And in this case, this isn't even a bug I would have made as a programmer. This, or I could have made it as a programmer, but also a designer or an artist might have made this, or it could have just happened from like version control. So uh, Crashlytics is pretty much a free integration if you're already using Firebase. So you might as well just drop it in and uh, again, for a little bit of extra safety net, just to bump the quality of, of your app up a little higher. With that, I'm gonna hand this over to Sumit to talk to you about growth. All right, y'all, so we built the game, we shipped the game, and now it's time to grow the game. Now, when you're growing your game, there's, to do, there's the traditional marketing methods uh, and teams that your company or startup might be using. Uh, where they run a campaign and try to grow your player or user base. And there's a lot of different tools and innovations available to those teams there. And that's probably something you want to continue to use. Um, that, however, is different than what I wanted to talk about here in the context of Firebase Developer Services and Google Cloud. So within the developer context, uh, what you want to be able to kind of do is easily A-B test new features, right? So you've shipped your game, you know where you're at now. And you want to kind of figure out, as you release new features, are they good or bad? How are they being received? And certainly, you don't want to damage what you've already released, right? So you want to be able to easily A-B test, and then furthermore, measure the results of those A-B tests as well to determine their effectiveness. Uh, personally, I'm still A-B testing, whether Gregory's Coffee, Starbucks Coffee, or Third Rail Coffee makes me more productive in the morning. Uh, results so far, inconclusive. Um, all right. So I'll set the stage with this question, right? Uh, or this opening use case of how can I track how my game is doing now? And how can I easily test new features and see if those are good? So we'll look at the first part of this question first, which is how can I track how my game is doing now? Okay, so to track how your game is doing, you've gotta look at data. And depending on the type of game that you have and the number of players, we could be talking about a lot of data. So take, for example, a massively multiplayer online RPG game where you're not just logging single events of users tapping on your screen or you know, interacting with your game as single events that are getting recorded, but you're collecting a stream of events over a long interval of time, maybe a few hours, right? In that kind of game, a player might be interacting with other players in the game and you're logging that. They might be buying, selling, or trading items and you're logging those. They might be completing quests or accepting new missions or taking a certain direction on your map. And these are all events that you're collecting, right? Over hours for one player. Now imagine if you've got thousands or millions of players. That's a lot of data that you're collecting. So uh, hence the image of this data center to kind of represent a whole lot of data. Um, for example, on one of Google services that relies on this. So that's where Google Cloud uh, BigQuery can come in. So if you're a large game publisher and you've already collected a lot of player data, uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud BigQuery has a, fill, a free bulk loading tool where you can upload all of that data into BigQuery and then start slicing and dicing it using SQL-like uh, queries with the computational power behind them to actually return the results. So you can start establishing a view of what your players are doing in your game. A couple of quick things to note about uh, uh, about BigQuery is that one, it's fully managed and serverless, and second, storage and compute are independent from each other and can scale up or scale down and on demand. So that kind of flexibility can save a lot of business costs from, from your side, because you don't have to invest upfront in building your own infrastructure for logging or storage pipelines to manage all this data. And of course, storing that amount of data is already a pain, let alone analyzing it to figure out what's going on. But maybe you're not ready to invest a lot of logging infrastructure in the game as you just released it, right? Maybe you just want to release your game and start getting some kind of analytics without having to invest in that logging or storage pipeline infrastructure. So for such a situation, you can use something like Google Analytics for Firebase. The way it works is pretty much as soon as you add the Firebase SDK to your project, you're going to start getting uh, out-of-the-box events automatically reported. Um, and when you log into your Firebase console, you're gonna see these reports automatically being generated uh, for your game. So that includes things like in-app purchase, purchase revenue, user engagement, retention, uh, daily active users, and so forth. But more importantly, 
Uh, analytics also allows you to use custom events that you can log in your game as well. So those are things that are more specific and interesting for your game. Uh, for Mega Hamster, this might be things like, did anyone use the map editor? Did someone create a map? How many times did they retry a level before they gave up? Did they even manage to finish the level? Uh, you know, which levels did they select? These kind of things are custom events that you might run to record, or that we'd run to record for Mecha Hamster, and you, you can also choose that for your own games and have it available in the analytics dashboard. And then while we're talking about creating these custom events, you'll want to mark some of these as conversion events as well. And you can do so in the Firebase console by hitting those toggles. Uh, one second, I'm trying to click the thing. Okay, sorry. By hitting those toggles, uh, those toggles uh, to mark whatever events that you're recording as conversion events. So those conversion events are the things that are especially important for your app and what you want to direct your users to do. So these could be things like, you know, did they create an account? Did they invite your friend to the game uh, or their friend to the game? Did they uh, give premium uh, currency to their games or give something to their, to their friends for the game? Those kind of things. Sorry, I need to go back to one slide. Okay. Um, and the other advantage with marking these things as conversion events, these important things for your game, is that Firebase can use that to feed that back to any ad campaigns you have to attract more users. Um, and it'll tailor the audiences that it goes after there based on this con the conversion data that you care about. Okay, so with, uh, Google, with Google Cloud BigQuery and with Firebase Analytics, you're starting to get a a picture, uh, a, you're starting to be able to paint a picture basically of what is going on in your game and what your players are doing. So we kind of answered the first part of this question of how can I track how my game is doing now. And once you know that, you want to look at the second part of now how can I easily test new features and see if those are good. So typically when you want to test a new set of features, you might have an alpha or beta channel uh, where you'll release that new set of features and expose it to a test group. Um, and that's well and good, but can ha often have a lot of overhead. For one, you have to kind of match the cadence of your team's release cycle uh, to, to get your build available for each of these channels. And then of course you need different build variants that you deploy to alpha or beta, which can start becoming a bit of a pain. Furthermore, if you're releasing a new feature and you want to easily get feedback on it, if you're just releasing it to alpha or beta users, you might not be getting a large amount of data versus your whole audience, or at least a larger percentage of your audience, where you're getting the feedback behind that new feature and being able to determine more and validate that it's working. And then here's another use case, right? What if you want to you know, just release a temporary seasonal or promotional new feature in your game? So in the case of Mecha Hamster, let's say we want to change the color of the hamster ball to white and red just for Canada Day when it's Canada Day in that user's device, on, in the date time of that user's device, and for our Canadian users, right? Oh, sorry, I gotta go one slide back. Um, so including that one, one change, one seasonal change or temporary change into your build can complicate that build because you've already got a few things planned, and introducing this one new feature can add some delay to that. In addition to that, um, if, you're, if there's other higher priority issues that come up for your team's current build, this might get dropped, right? There might be other things that they have to focus on, and this is not really something they can do, and then you risk losing it entirely. So for both of those use cases, when you want to release new features and easily test them, as well as for seasonal changes you want to introduce in your game, there's Firebase Remote Config that we wanted to kind of introduce. So um, if you haven't heard of this before, you can kind of think of it as a key value pair that a key value store that lives in the cloud, and it allows you to control the look and feel of your game or the behavior of your game remotely without having to rebuild different versions of your, of your app and deploy to all of the different channels and app stores. So this is the way it works. Um, going back to our example for uh, the Canada Day hamster ball, here are some default values for what the hamster ball looks like now. Right? So we've got ball color, ball glow, and ball size as, per, as remote config parameters we define with these defaults. So whenever the user starts up the phone for the first time, these are normally the values that they'll see for their ball. Next, we introduce some new values uh, for the ball, ball color being white and the ball glow being red, um, and we can condition those or gate them on specific 
any kind of conditions. In this case, it would be that it is Canada Day on the user's phone, on their date time on their device, and that they're located in Canada. So for those users, we want to push these values. These will then be waiting in the cloud, ready to replace the values that we've set as the default. And then when the condition hits and everything is true, it'll combine those values, pull in the delta, and then change the look of the ball for those Canadian users. Another cool thing about the way remote config works is that it only downloads the delta uh, or the difference, the diff of the values for the remote config variables and not the whole set every time. So you're not gonna eat up a lot of your user's data by using remote config. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, isn't this kind of like feature rollout flagging? And yeah, it is, that's kind of the idea behind it. So um, it allows you to kind of easily, you know, control feature rollouts for your game without having to redeploy uh, different builds and enable and disable that via the Firebase console. Uh, one thing I should mention, actually in the previous slide, can I go two slides back? Sorry. So uh, those va new values that you set, you'd actually set those in the Firebase console directly. So you can do it through the Firebase console or you can do it uh, via the REST API. So that's how you can set and condition the new values you wanna set on. Okay, so we kind of saw a little bit of how to use remote config for this kind of new seasonal feature that we want to release for Canada Day. But how, how about like for more general use cases? There's some other t uh, times where remote config can be helpful. And more importantly, when you're testing or releasing these new features, you want to get the feedback behind them. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so taking a look back at the custom events that I created uh, for Google Analytics for Firebase for Mecha Hamster. Um, if you look at the ones on the right-hand side, I'm collecting retries, uh, whether the user finished the level, and what levels they've selected. Well, you could imagine that, you know, let's say a user who just started playing this game, they have a large number of retries for a given level, or they never managed to complete one, or they've only selected a certain group of levels that are fairly easy to complete. You can imagine that those are kind of like beginners to my game. Well, one cool thing about the way remote config and analytics works is that it allows you to create different audiences based on these custom events you can filter or out of the box events as well uh, in analytics. In this case for Mecha Hamster, I'm creating a beginner's audience and I wanna target remote config variables only to that audience. I'm defining that as any, any players who have a number of retries recorded at greater than five and who haven't completed a, le a level. So I've identified this beginner audience and for them, I'm gonna change the values of my remote config parameters and set the ball size to big and the gravity to 0 0.5 to make the game easier for them to play. Okay, so that's cool, right? Um, I can easily release new things, but what about different variants that I wanna try? So for example, for my beginner audience, uh, that new ball size and gravity that I set might make the game like way too easy for them and quite boring, right? For, for cases where I wanna test multiple variations or combinations of these to see which one works best for my beginner audience. Um, there's Firebase A-B testing as well that works in combination with remote config and analytics for that purpose. And here are the steps for setting up A-B testing. So the first thing is you define your target, right? Whether that's 5% of your total audience or whether that's all your users who speak Korean, you can set that up however you like for Mecha Hamster, that's gonna be the beginner's audience that I defined earlier. Step two is you create your variance. So again, for Mecha Hamster, that would be different combinations of ball size and gravity. So just to see which combination works best for this beginner group. Step three is to determine the goal for your A-B test. So these can be out of the box goals that come from analytics, things like daily user engagement and that kind of thing. It can also be custom events that you care about. So what is the goal? What is the thing that you wanna measure with these different variants to see if your experiment is successful or not? For Mecha Hamster, that would probably be that I want my daily user engagement to increase. I want the number of retries to go down so that they're having an easier time. And I might add secondary goals, right? For example, user retention is a secondary goal that I'd add here, because I wanna make sure I'm not negatively affecting the retention of my game among other beginners in, in that group who might find all those variants boring and might stop playing the game entirely. So you can choose what goals you want uh, for your A-B test as well and set those here. And then the last step is just to kind of wait and relax and let the experiments run for a couple of weeks 
and start generating some data that you can look at. By the end of that, you'll be able to determine if there's one group that performed extremely well and then roll that out as the new control more broadly among your beginner audience or whatever other audience you define. Okay, so thus far, we're using remote config to release new features. We're using A-B testing to test different variants and figure out which one works best and then roll that out more broadly. But this, up to now, has all been reactive things we've been doing for our players. We've been seeing how they've behaved so far and then choosing to, f and then, you know, basically adding new features based on what we've seen at that point. But wouldn't it be cool if we could anticipate what they're gonna do? And in fact, if we could predict the future and predict how our users can behave instead of reacting to it. So if only there was someone who could tell us our futures. Well, there is. And that's uh, Firebase Predictions, uh, another product available in uh, Firebase. So um, Firebase can harness the power of machine learning to create groups of users who are predicted to exhibit some kind of behavior in your app. The general idea is that as your players are playing your game, Google Analytics is collecting a bunch of data and storing that, and then predictions can take a look at that data to see if there's a, any patterns that exist for things that these players have done before they took some other desired action. So let's say, for example, that desired action is a player who spent money in your game or made an in-app purchase. What, f what predictions will do is go ahead and look at users who have already made purchases and look at the past data. Then it will use a neural network powered by TensorFlow to see if there are any patterns that these users have exhibited before they made that purchase. Once it does that, it'll start making groups of users categorized as likely spenders or unlikely spenders. And once those groups have been identified by predictions, you can use those groups in other features in Firebase and you can target those predicted users who are predicted to spend in your game. So whether that's in remote config or in A-B tests, you can now choose that group and specifically target different changes that you wanna roll out to just them. So let's look at a few examples of different developers who have done this. Nope, we're gonna look at that later. <laughs> can, one can I go back one? Can I go back one slide? All right. So how do you, so how do you enable um, this magic of, of, of machine learning to your games? Do you have to go back to school and take a neural network programming class and and graduate from that again? It might not hurt, but you don't have to do any of that. You can actually just press this button in the Firebase console. Um, so once you press this, it turns predictions on. And from that point, it's gonna start collecting data and within a few weeks, you should have some predictions data you can play with. Now, um, out of the box, the two different events that predictions works for is to determine spenders and non-spenders, and also users who might churn from your app or continue using it. But in addition to those, you can use other custom events that you care about and use predictions to figure out if those actions are likely to happen as well. So those are those um, custom events that I mentioned earlier that you would mark as conversion events or things that are particularly important for your game. So you can mark those and then predictions will start training over that as well. Okay, so here's where I was getting to earlier about examples of different game publishers who have used some combinations of these features uh, to realize some pretty good value. So uh, in this case, there's Halfbrick. Uh, what they did is that they used predictions to determine churners people who are likely to stop playing their game. And in that group, they targeted notifications where that gifted them premium currency in their game. And in doing so, they saw uh, a 20% boost in seven day user retention. And it performed better than a fixed reward system that they had earlier. There's also Rockbyte. So they used a combination of predictions and remote config. Uh, and in their case, they used the groups that checked for spenders. And for those that were determined to spend, they changed the store layout uh, to better match their, their patterns. And for those who are determined not, to not spend, they had a, a different layout through the remote config that they configured. And in doing so, they increased their profitability and remained competitive in an already competitive, already competitive mobile gaming industry. Okay, so at this point, let's say you've used analytics to collect insights into your data or Google Cloud BigQuery and upload your data to slice and dice it. You're using um, remote config, A-B testing to test different variants. And this is all great. And let's say as a result of this, you've got a lot of users and a lot of players. And that's fantastic. That's kind of what you want. 
But now you've got a lot of data, right? You've got a lot of players and a lot of data that you've accumulated across all of these different features. So remember that the image of that data center that I showed earlier when I talked about a lot of features and then I very sneakily introduced BigQuery? Well, here's another example where BigQuery can help. So uh, Firebase and BigQuery integrate really easily with each other and you can export all those different features that I just mentioned. Um, so analytics data, crashlytics data, as well as predictions data into BigQuery where you can slice and dice it for other insights that you want to gain. So uh, this is really useful because there's some things that these dashboards themselves might not do, but that you could write your own queries against to figure out all kinds of things. Um, here's some examples. So for analytics, right, if you export your analytics data into BigQuery, you can analyze user retention trends for your game and identify root causes behind them. For Crashlytics, you can segment crashes by levels, libraries, or any other custom key that you include in your crash logs. So whatever custom key you put in there, once you've exported your Crashlytics data into BigQuery, you can now use that if you'd like to see, okay, level three has an issue and level three is where most of these crashes are happening fairly easily. And then for predictions, uh, one really straightforward use case and a very common one is to identify your biggest spenders by city or by country as, uh, by running a query, again, uh, in, in BigQuery once you've exported your data. So this kind of wraps up everything we wanted to share with you guys. Uh, we hope this helped you feel excited about using Firebase for your games. We hope there's at least one or two use cases where you, can, um, where you see that you can use Firebase to help in your game development. And hopefully you get started um, and reach out to us when you have any questions. Um, at the moment, I think we still have some time for Q&A, if there's any uh, live Q&A you guys want to do in the room. Uh, otherwise, we'll be uh, just outside of here. I think they're closing down this room at 6 o'clock. So uh, we'll be just outside and hanging out if, any, if you have any questions for us. But let's first, I guess, open the room and see if anyone has any questions. If you guys want to join back on the stage. Any questions on using Firebase? Going once, going twice. Awesome, we did oh. our job. There's <laughs> uh, <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, oh, I think there's a mic coming as well, just so if other folks can hear you. Hi. Uh, does the Unity plugin natively support Windows or just iOS and Android right now? Um, I believe that's just Android. Uh, Android and iOS, right? Yeah, right now it's just iOS and Android. Okay, so if I wanted to use Windows, I'd have to use the, like, wrap the C++ uh, SDK? I believe the C++ SDK right now is in early beta, right? Yeah. And not all of the features are spec'd out. It's good enough for you to like use in the Unity editor or to test on desktop, but um, we're still working on it, and it is open source now, so um, it, if you, go faster than us, you can get there too. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, if there are any questions you guys want to ask us in private, we'll be just outside. Um, also, I want to remind you guys to scan uh, your badges on the way out, just to make sure you get the evaluation forms to give us feedback on the talk. And with that, thank you again for participating. Also, there's, uh, if you want to download MechAmster and give it a try, you can download it from the App Store or Play Store. We also have all the code hosted uh, on GitHub there. If you want to download that, build it, and check it out. Um, and to learn more about how Firebase can help with your games development, there's that URL right there, firebase.google.com slash games. Um, and we've got a booth, and we're going to be there most of the week. Uh, it's in this building uh, at spot P1501. I think it's in the, yeah, the South Hall is here. So we'll be there all that week if you want to come by and say hello. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.